All right, just a few minutes away from the closing bell. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Inez Frey to see how we finish out the week. Hi, Inez. Oh, what a week it's been, Dave. Let me pull up a five-day chart so you can take a look at our Wi-Fi Interactive. The NASDAQ up 8% for the last five days. The S&P 500 set to end the week up more than 5.5% higher, heading for its best week since June. Looking at the sectors, I'm going to pull up a five-day chart for the sector so you can see technology and communication services, the big winners, but all 11 sectors of the S&P 500 up for the week. Over on the NASDAQ 100, this is a five-day chart. I'm going to pull up an intraday here so you can see Amazon extending the gains from yesterday up more than 4%. Also checking out Netflix up 5% today and Nvidia is also higher as well. Pulling up a two day chart you can see from the big gains that we saw yesterday. Amazon up 17% over the last two days. Apple up 11%, Netflix up 13%. Here's a closing bell for today, Friday, November 11th. All right, stocks ending the day higher. It looks like the Dow closed at 33,753. That's up for a whopping 37 points. S&P 500 ending the day up 36 points. And the NASDAQ, that has been the leader all week. That's up about 1.8%. And now for a closer look at the broader markets, let's bring in Gene Goldman, Chief Investment Officer at Cetera Investment Management, and Chris Wolf, First Republic Private Wealth Management CIO. So um, let's, uh, let's kick this off just by giving your general overview of the week, Gene. Uh, what do you think of all the news that has been handed to us on a platter? <laughs> on a platter. First of all, thank you for letting me be on your show. On a platter, that's a great point. I mean, I think as we've been saying, you know, inflation is starting to roll over. The Fed's raising rates is finally being felt by the economy. We're seeing signs of disinflation. Clearly, the market has the path of least resistance is moving higher. This inflation narrative is definitely improving. You look to China, we have zero COVID restrictions started to be lifted. You've seen some Fed speak saying maybe some slower hikes. And the beauty about today, what I really liked, a weaker dollar. The dollar was weaker. This is great news especially in terms of market sentiment. Great, great news this week. And Chris, do you feel the same or do you think there's any risks that the market isn't pricing in correctly right now? Well, you know, there used to be an old commercial, how do you spell relief? And it was R-O-L-A-I-D-S, so Rolades, right? And how do you upset stomach? So look, we had a lot of positioning for Bayer that the inflation numbers are gonna be bad. And I think that was evident in the rally that we saw on Thursday. Um, you know, keep in mind, inflation is still 7.7% CPI numbers. That's the kind of broad measure. The personal consumption uh, expenditure numbers are still in the kind of four or five range, and they're unlikely to come down as fast as the market wants. Now, that said, I think Gene's right. This is good news, at least in the near term. It's good news for people that want to reposition their portfolios, upgrade. Uh, you've seen a lot of the junkier things kind of rally pretty hard off the bottom. Uh, but keep in mind, you still have uh, year-to-date numbers that look pretty awful. Communication services down 37, 38 percent, energy up 70 percent. It's still been a one-trick pony market year-to-date. So I think the repositioning opportunities are probably the biggest ones you have between now and the end of the year. Gene, we saw some impressive numbers from uh, Inez there from Microsoft, Google, Apple, Amazon, Tesla, all week, all rallying, cannot continue. Yeah, I think Chris's comments were really great. There's some great names in terms of very cheap right now, cheap and opportunities. So one of our favorite sectors right now is technology. Coming into this year, we weren't a big fans. We were underweight technology. Now we've been buying technology like crazy in our portfolios. Valuations are cheaper. Uh, technology is the longest duration equity sector, so benefits from a pullback in rates. Tech spending will keep up. Companies need to protect their profit margins. They need to drive productivity in a very tough labor market. And you're seeing a ton of cost cutting. Companies, tech companies, are focusing on more profitable business lines. We like that a lot. Within tech, our favorite industries are software and IT services, most likely to benefit from capital spending. And if you look at 2023 earnings estimates for these industries, looking like pretty good double-digit earnings growth. We like technology a lot right now. Uh, Chris, what do you like here? Uh, tech, is that on your radar? 
Yeah, tech is on our radar, more neutral in terms of our sector outlook, uh, mostly because our expectation around inflation uh, is a double-edged sword. As well, it comes down, the Fed probably does a pause, not a pivot, but a pause next year. Uh, I think the other piece of the puzzle is inflation has inflated profit margins. So we expect profit margins in a number of industries to come under a bit of pressure next year, hence the repositioning comments. But I think sector-wise, you know, some things that look interesting to us include healthcare. Some of the consumer staples haven't been down as much. They've kind of rallied on a, a kind of return to liquidity here. Tech is okay, but we're much more selective rather than just buying the broad basket. And interestingly enough, as you get some of the beaten down areas like industrials and materials, while we're neutral now, there could be some room as we get into the first half of next year to upgrade them. And Gene, as we look at some of the potential turning points ahead, perhaps a pause by the Fed, depending on how consistent the inflation data is, what should people do if they have a shorter time horizon versus a longer one, considering that most people expect a recession in the first half of next year? Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, we we say there's a high chance, a high probability of a recession next year. I mean, there's so much evidence we can look at. We can spend another hour talking about those reasons. The good news is that we expect a mild recession, and there's three things we point to. Number one, the labor market is pretty strong. Yes, it will weaken, but it's still coming off a very strong foundation. Number two, the housing market. The housing market is in great shape. I mean, I know it's weakening a bit, but we have low inventories, high owner's equity. We've got product risk. It's just less in mortgages. And then also, you just think about you know, uh, banks are in much better shape, less debt service, great for the housing. The third thing we believe in terms of mild recession is that we're not going to see a dark, steep recession. We see this recession rolling through different sectors. So manufacturing now, maybe autos, maybe housing down the road, maybe like consumer spending, leisure spending. So again, we're optimistic and we do think the markets have priced in a little bit more of a severe recession. So a mild recession, in our opinion, will be a good catalyst for the market. Chris, is that how you see it ahead, a mild recession on the way? Uh, I hope that's the case. Our odds are 75% for a recession in the first half of next year. So I agree, kind of generally, we're going to get something that's going to look like a pretty big slowdown. I think the risk is really around the job market. Keep in mind, the Fed's got to go until likely something breaks, the job market, inflation, you know, maybe something going on in uh, other areas of the market. That's typically what happens. You call it financial accident. So I, I think we want to be a little bit sensitive to how much work the Fed has already done, how much they continue to have to do to get inflation down. Keep in mind, history says they don't ever stop raising rates until their rate of inf uh, interest, which is the Fed funds rate, is above the rate of inflation measured by the core PCE. That doesn't happen until next year. I think the recession might be mild because it's really hard to push consumers down. Uh, year over year spending historically is up 90 plus percent of the time, go back 75 years. So consumers carrying the weight of the economy, I think end up being the driver for why a recession may not be that severe. I think the one piece of the puzzle though is that the Fed does get on that job market and companies pull back, we'd be a bit more cautious about what the recession might look like. Gene, we got time for just one more uh, real quick. Uh, you mentioned a weaker dollar before. What happens if the dollar strengthens again? Any uh, cracks that might surface? Ah, that's that's the age old question right now. Clearly, the Fed, you know, as Chris, as Chris said, the Fed has made mistakes. And one big potential mistake, the fallout is a strong dollar. The dollar is up, was it 18, 19 percent so far this year? We're watching that very carefully. We saw the effect on UK pensions. We see other things. A stronger dollar is something that we would be worried about. But the positive of a stronger dollar is that it helps keep the Fed on pause. We saw back in 14, 15, strong dollar helped the Fed pause rate hikes. Again, we can see the same thing. Good for the Fed, tough for some of these multinational companies with some exposure, though. A big thank you to Gene Goldman and Chris Wolf for joining us for this market roundup.